scriptures together, but I take one of those young men with me each week visiting, and I let them take those things that we study and try to apply that in real life, and we find out, particularly we go to older folks' home when they can no longer see well, and we find out what their favorite passages were, and we let those young men read from the scripture. That accomplished a lot of things, you know, it allowed them to see what the work of the Lord's all about, let them see, uh, uh, different side of their preacher, uh, allowed them to take some of those uh, principles and truths that they'd learned and um, share those with other folks, learned how to, uh, to be servants. And they also learned some conditions of people's lives. You know, when you go into different homes and folks are uh, struggling with health and, and uh, a wife maybe is caring for uh, an invalid husband or vice versa. And they see the real life context that's going on. Dear folks who made vows in their lives 50 years earlier are now in the twilight years and they're keeping their vows. All those things get filed away in young people's minds. And, but if we don't involve them, the only time they see us is when we enter the pulpit and uh, we may preach outstanding sermons. We may have great deliveries. But if they never get to see it embodied in a real life setting, then when crunch time comes, they don't know how to operate. They don't know how to make those applications. And so it's helpful if we take these lessons we've learned, and these things are written for time, we're written for our learning. And when we see the, the quality and character of Joshua, we might say, you know, he was a mentor by a great man. Uh, 
uh, he got to walk with and beside Moses. He got to see the ups and downs and how to deal with people and all those experiences Joshua had uh, prepared him for this occasion we read about in this book. Now the children of Israel are about to experience the fulfillment of the promise God made hundreds of years before their forefather Abraham. They're about to conquer a land. Guess who their leader is? It's Joshua. So no wonder his name means Jehovah's salvation. Uh, Jehovah certainly kept his word, hasn't he? They're about to, to take this land. Here's this man who <clears throat> wears a name that's a reminder of God's blessings in their life. So with that in mind, just a quick rehearsal of those things that, that we looked at yesterday before we go into today's uh, chapters. We spent some time talking about uh, this being, that is Joshua being, the first of those 12 books of history uh, of this nation of people. They're very historic books. They tell us uh, the beginning of the children of Israel's existence in the Promised Land and their function. Uh, we spent some time talking about uh, Joshua being the author of the book. And if you could read and have read some objections to that and what those objections might be and uh, get all the evidence that points to Joshua. And those uh, Jewish scholars uh, gave him credit as being the author. So those closest to the scene um, and to that time frame uh, said it was Joshua. He's son of none. Uh, um, uh, don't know much about his childhood. Uh, that is, we don't know much about Joshua's uh, childhood. But we do know um, that he was the son of none. So he uh, obviously functioned as a son. Maybe that's an indication uh, that he did that well. That he was the kind of young person that God wanted him to be and lived in the way that, that God would have him to, uh, to live. And therefore, um, God could accomplish through him and in him uh, those things that he wanted to accomplish. We want to keep those things in mind as we rehearse these, uh, these great events and um, have some emphasis about... Uh, how we ought to be the kind of person, number one, we ought to be, and then understand that folks are watching us. Um, we're going to be mentors for good or for evil. Mentors we're going to be. We're going to teach folks either to be uh, shy and complacent, maybe even apathetic, because they see someone who is shy and, and complacent and apathetic. And so they watch... Uh, uh, our behavior and they emulate those things so therefore whether we like it or not we are mentors and Joshua was a recipient of a great example and therefore he was mentored in a strong way and therefore he could say of his own family as this book will conclude as for me and my house we'll serve Jehovah he knew how to mentor uh, he knew how to carry out these things and, and his uh, two speeches in the Colac climactic part of this book, Joshua emphasizes uh, those kind of choices. Here's a man who emulated how to make choices. Uh, he could have chosen to do a lot of things, but he could have been the 11th spy that said, can't do it. Could have, but he wasn't. So he made some choices. Um, he stood up and spoke up, even though he had convictions that they should go up at once, he could have just been quiet complacent. He said, that's not how I feel, but too many of them, and so I'm not going to buck the system. But he and, and Caleb spoke up publicly. He said, no, that's not the way it is. And no, you're forgetting one important ingredient here. When you go back and read the context of, of Numbers chapter 13 and 14, he was selected by Moses to be a representative of, of his tribe to go into the land. He took that seriously. And he did that to the best of his ability. And he brought back what he believed to be the truth. And when it came time for the people to hear the report, he didn't let just one side be represented. He spoke up. Because of that, he's influencing now a whole nation of people, and they respond to him in a positive way. Um, the theme, obviously, is of the conquest and dividing of the land. That's the entirety of the book. Uh, obviously, a lot of chapters and, and verses, but that's the thrust of it. They'll conquer this land and 
and divided up among the tribe. And that was always the intent, that God wanted them to have, have this land, and so he would um, uh, provide this occasion. But somebody's got to do it. Who is that? Well, it's Joshua. And a tremendous responsibility. This is not just a man that, that sits in the Oval Office and, 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 um, and signs bills. This is a man who led the fight. And uh, this is a man who uh, was out in the trenches. This is a man who had to uh, uh, take the land that was given to him and settle it just like everybody else. And uh, you know, he had to be uh, prepared for living. And he had to provide for his family. All that's going on while he's being a, a leader of this nation of people. Uh, the key thought is how to be successful in life. If we're going to learn any lesson from the book of Joshua, we're going to learn that one. And that is, this is how to be successful in life. And that is, follow the instructions of the Lord. And we spent some time looking at God specifically telling him, this is how you're going to be successful. I'm going to be with you. I'm never going to leave you. Here's what I expect of you. You can't turn to the right or to the left, and you can't let my word fall to the ground. It's got to be your direction and instruction for life, and when you follow God's instructions, you have the ingredients for success. Do all he says do, and, and be strong and of good courage. Now, we should not be courageous if we're not doing what the Lord told us to do. Foolish thing, that to be disobedient to the Lord. Do not be dismayed. And there are plenty of occasions that we, we've already seen in our first 12 chapters where they faced obstacles. One in particular, when they go against Ai and, and they're defeated, Joshua was just made. And uh, you remember God rebuked him and told him to get up, and told him why they had been dis- defeated. And then he said, uh, now I'm going to be with you. Once they removed the sin from the camp, and he said, be strong and good courage, be not dismayed. So you have to resume what uh, uh, God charged you to do even after you face obstacles. God will be with you and prosper your ways, what he told Joshua. Well, what about us? If we follow the Lord's instructions, he's going to be with us. Will our way prosper? Well, certainly it will. And we need to make sure we understand those lessons. And again, the key verse is Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15. Where Joshua places in his last speech to the people that show us before them choice he's already made. He knew the choices were obvious. They had a history. Uh, they came from idolatrous people, that is those Tira and his family beyond the flood were idolatrous people. Uh, so they could go back and to their heritage and say, I want to worship those gods. Or they were surrounded by Amorites who, uh, and other folks in the land who had idolatrous gods. They could serve those. Joshua's assessment of his own choice was, but, as for me and my house, we will serve Jehovah. We'll spend some time looking at that when we get there, but when the folks say, we'll serve Jehovah, he chastises them somewhat and says, no, you won't. And they said, oh, yes, we will. And said, no, you won't. And finally they you know, reached down deep and said, oh, yes, we will. You can be a witness to us. And Joshua will finally say, these stones here will be a witness. They heard what you said. <clears throat> so, as long as these stones here be a witness that you said you do what the Lord said to do. I think it's interesting that this book closes the same way the book of Judges opens, and it says that generation kept their word. They were faithful to the Lord all the days of Joshua. And all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua. So these people who were present and made that uh, commitment and made that choice kept their word. And so uh, we have to make that personal choice ourselves. What if we're the only ones that make such a choice? You know, we have to do that every day of our life, don't we? Yeah. I hear people say, you know, I don't know what I'd do if, uh, you know, if my wife wouldn't fail. I don't know what I'd do if my husband wouldn't fail. I don't know what I'd do if my children turned away from the Lord. And you witness and I witness people who are influenced by their spouses and they forsake the Lord. And they begin to try to tweak and change the Lord's doctrine to fit the context that they feel like they're forced into by their family. Or they're so broken hearted over their children's bad decisions and they think, well, maybe it's my parenting skills and, you know, maybe I'm not worthy to, uh, to serve the Lord. And they'll unplug from all the activities of serving the Lord because of the immediate context 
that they find themselves in. Rather than start with the spiritual context and say, if it's just me and the Lord, he promised never to leave me nor forsake me. That's right. Now the choice is, am I going to leave him and forsake him? If that answer is no, then if it's just me and the Lord, I can be happy. And fellas, it's an insult to the Lord for us to say there's any earthly relationship we have that would cause us not to serve him faithfully. You know, even if it's because we're just made because of loved ones and choices. Just pause and say, now what happens if I quit serving the Lord? If I say, well, I can't preach anymore because I don't have a support family. You ignored your spiritual family. You promised never leaving or forsake you. What you just said to him? You're not the most important thing to me, personally. These other folks are. And even though you're not going to leave me for safety, they have. And so now I'm dismayed. And I'm discouraged. So I'm not going to serve you anymore. How do you think he feels about that? And see, we, we do to the Lord then what we feel like others have done to us. We don't have any conscience of, of him being broken hearted or uh, disappointed in us. So we have to get to that point where we can say, if it is just me and the Lord, we're going to serve him. And I'm going to do what he tells me to do. If I'm the only one to go to heaven, am I going to be miserable? Absolutely not. That's not my goal in life. I want to take as many people as I can with me. But if no one else chose to go, I still want to go. Amen. Don't oh, you? That's right. Sometimes we preach differently than that, Mike. Oh, boy, you know. I don't know. All these people are going to turn away. And what's the church going to be like tomorrow? I don't know if it's going to be here for our children. Well, the church will always be here. Our children may not be members of it. It's going to always be here. Why? The Lord said, the gates of hell would not prevail against you. So do we think we're going to prevail against you? The answer is that is no. And so let's place ourselves in this context and say, what lessons can we learn from this book? And I think we learned all those lessons. Joshua made up his mind. If it's just me and my Lord, uh, we're going to do what we need to do. And he was a great leader because of that. Israel history, during the time of Joshua's leadership, uh, is strong and powerful. Because he was strong and powerful. And not just because he, he individually uh, developed those skills. God gave him such an opportunity to develop them. And God is the one to assure him he could be strong and of good courage. And so the book begins with the death of Moses. And so they weren't allowed just to mourn and say, you know, the only great leader that ever exists is dead. So here we are. We do that sometimes in our family. You know, Grandpa dies and say, all oh, the leadership in the family has gone. Well, then Grandpa didn't do his job. You know, if Grandpa was as great as we think he was and is, then surely he taught us his skills. If we think he was that kind of person, surely he taught us how to live. What do we have to do with Grandpa gone? We have to step up and do what Grandpa did. Don't we? That's right. And so we have to have that understanding that when this book opens, it mentions the death of Moses, but it doesn't dwell on it anymore. They haven't had their mourning time. That's over. The funeral's completed. Now life goes on. And we still have to do that. We have to mourn those who depart this life, and we take those lessons we've learned from them, and we apply it to our life, and this mantle of leadership is then passed down to the next generation. Joshua represents that generation. And the book starts where Deuteronomy ends. Uh, Moses had assembled Joshua and the people before him and uh, rehearsed what God had told him and said, Joshua, you're it. He told the people, He's it. And so now God's reminding Joshua that he's it. And, uh, and so the book ends with the, this book ends with the death of Joshua. It ends with the death of Moses and it ends with the death of Joshua. And so that tells us somewhat about the context of it. We need to make sure that we don't forget those lessons that are obvious that we need to uh, emulate. I don't think I mentioned this to you yesterday. They were Loading the, the video and those things, so I got a little distracted. Um, I don't remember us talking particularly about the dates, but um, um, the date which has been assigned to the book, um, if the Exodus is assumed to be 1490 BC, um, then the invasion of Canaan would be about 1450 BC because we have the, the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And if Joshua ruled for 25 years, the book could have been written between 
1450 and 1425 BC. I don't remember mentioning that. I have highlighted in my notes that uh, <coughs> if I did, you've got it twice. If I didn't, now you have it. Um, so that gives us a little perspective of, of the time frame. And so that means that uh, Joshua um, would have been born about the time Moses flees into Midian. Isn't that kind of interesting? And he grows up in slavery. He kind of left that part out. We talked about him being a soldier and being a spy. And, and uh, uh, you know, now being this leader of people, he was also a slave. So he wasn't like being servant to you. Um, so maybe that's part of the reason why, as long as Joshua was alive, they weren't in servitude to these folks. They were courageous in facing their enemy. So he knew what it was like uh, uh, to be um, a slave. And even though some of his comrades didn't, didn't shake that stigma, you know, they didn't know how to make decisions and move forward. And they even said, we'd rather go back to Egypt and let somebody tell us what to do. Tell us what to get up and what to do every day. At least it was... Not complicated for us. You see, when we're when we're free, whether you're talking about physical freedom or spiritual freedom, there's some responsibilities come with that. Okay, you're free. What are you going to do? You're going to make good decisions. You're going to be the right kind of person. You're going to influence other folks. <coughs> too. Uh, who are you going to be? Uh, that becomes significant. Joshua was always out front leading. So we kind of outline the book in simple form, saying the the first chapter through the fifth chapter was a preparation of that occupation of the land of Canaan. They had to get ready. Uh, they had to do some preliminary things before they uh, went over to the land and, and conquered it. And then we had the conquest itself from chapter 6 up to where we ended our discussion yesterday. And uh, that was uh, uh, bring us to chapter 13 where they divide the land. It was a tribal allocation of the land. That is, they divided according to the tribes. And then the farewell uh, speech of Joshua in chapter 22 uh, through chapter 24. That was the outline I gave you. And uh, then we walked through that outline in a little more detail and looked at Joshua's commission and God speaking to him and telling him what to do um, and that he was going to be the one to lead them and he was going to lead them into Canaan. Canaan had significance. Um, God had always promised that to Abraham. Uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, tells us that Abraham never uh, inhabited that land uh, in the sense that he controlled it. He was a stranger in that land of promise. And his seed would inherit it, and, uh, or did inherit it. And this is the beginning of that inheritance. And then we spent some time breaking down that uh, conquest and uh, looked at how they went about doing that um, they had a, a had to go against Jericho and that was kind of unique and specific uh, God lined them up and they marched around the city six times uh, uh, once a day for six days and then on the seventh day seven times on the seventh day they blew the trumpets and shouted and the walls fell down uh, we then had uh, the fording of the Jordan and, uh, the ceremony is at Gilgal in uh, chapter uh, 5. And then from Gilgal, they did what? They began those conquests, and Jericho being the first. And then they went against Ai, and what happened? They were defeated. All right, they were defeated there. Why? Because of Achan's yeah. sin. All right, Achan's sin. What did he do? He took the, the, the spoils of the land of Jericho. All right, he took the spoils of the, of the city, mm -hmm. and uh, why was that a sin? We don't want because God. it was we dedicated to God. God. All right, God said it's going to be dedicated to me, and you can't take any of those things for yourself. You're going to destroy all the people and all the things, with the exception of those things of value, the gold and the silver and, and uh, things of brass, you're to bring back and you're to sanctify that, dedicate that to me. And uh, he took some of those things for himself. And, you know, sin is a transgression of the law. Yeah. God speaks. It's law. Mm -hmm. Not negotiable. And uh, uh, Achan knew it. And how did they go about finding out that Achan did it? Down to the, down to the All right. They, they started out. 
called them all together, and then they divided them up into tribes, and from the tribes they you know, divided them into uh, families, and from family down to the household of, of Achan. And uh, 36 of his brethren died of Ai because of his sin. But sometimes the consequences of our behavior affects other folks, don't it? It's, it's something we need to be conscious of. So that happened at Ai, and uh, Joshua and the elders were distraught, and they mourned over it, and God finally just told them to get up. Sorry to hear them whine about it, and uh, told them what had happened. Didn't tell them who it was, let them go through the process of identifying who it was. And what they do to Achan? They stoned him and his whole family. All right, stoned stone him and his whole family, his livestock, and, yeah, and then burned them. That's okay. right. They're already dead. Yep. Why burn them? Well, just to illustrate, God's not going to tolerate sin. Right. Nor will the people of God tolerate it. And that was uh, going to be a reminder for them. Then they go back against AI, and you remember the uh, whose idea was it for them to lay ambush at AI? Men mm-hmm. of Israel. It's God. Ah, God. God. God was the first one told Joshua and said, Here's how you're going to do it. That's right. Remember, he'd given them instructions at Jericho in, in detail, and they didn't consult God before they went against Ai. That's right. They thought, well, Ai's next, and so we don't need that many people. If, if all of us went up against Jericho and it fell so easily, two or 3,000 men will do it. And uh, you see, had they consulted God, God would have said, don't go up. You're not ready to go up. You're yeah. sinning again. But they didn't consult God, and so they defeated. So after the sin was removed, God says, you lay an ambush. And what did Joshua say to the people then? We're going to lay an ambush. That's right. And so that always worked when God spoke to the leader. And the leader spoke to the people and said exactly what God said. It always worked out. And guess what will happen today? Get a man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 11. Don't open your mouth to speak for God unless you're going to Speak what God has revealed. In all Scripture, remember we mentioned yesterday from Second Timothy chapter three and verse sixteen, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, for truth, correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God. When we talked about those prophets being man of God, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished in all good works. So whose work will that be? It'll be God's work. Why? Because He's revealed them. We'd be focused on that. So that takes place in, in uh, chapter 7 through chapter 8, verse 29. Um, that is the failure to conquer Ai and then the, the removal of the sand and finding the name to ambush. And then there was the uh, covenant ceremony and uh, um, uh, at Shechem. You remember we talked about uh, Israel at Gerizim and Ebal. Uh, where were the blessings pronounced? Arizona. Gee, good. Uh, uh, where are the curses pronounced? Evil. All right, <laughs> evil, because it's e- evil. And so, um, God's always laid before man a choice. He did with Adam and Eve, and he has with everybody since. We have to choose what we're going to do. We spent some time looking at the different confederations, you know, the campaign in the southern and central uh, Canaan, in chapter 9 through chapter 10, verse 27 where those kings got together and said, all right, here's what we've heard and here's what we've seen, and these folks are coming against us. And uh, we're going to have to team up. And um, they weren't very successful at it, but they teamed up anyway. And then that victory in those southern um, parts of, of Palestine in chapter 10, verse 28, 43, and, um, and then the... the uh, Northern Campaign in chapter 11, uh, the first uh, 15 verses or so. Uh, then that brought us to where we were yesterday when we ended, and that is the summary of Joshua's conquest. And we spent a little bit of time trying to glean lessons from that particular aspect. Sometimes when you read through the scriptures, it gets a little laborious to you, particularly when the repetition of things. Who we get soon, and then when it tells you what happened, and then it pauses and says, Oh, by the way, um, this is what happened in summary. It's like, Well, I've already read that. Why did it stop? And, you know, it is to emphasize that God's keeping his promise in minute detail. 
He gives us the geographical location. He tells us how they went about doing it. He, he then says these are the kings that are involved, and he specifies then for us uh, how successful they were. What did he promise Joshua? Success. If he did what? If he followed the instruction, he's obedient. And so now the summary is they have been successful. Why? Because they've been obedient. And so in chapter 12, yesterday we concluded by looking at that list of kings that were defeated. And on the east side, what kings were defeated that even the heathens kept bringing up their name? Sihon and Og. All right, Sihon and Og. And uh, remember Rahab said, we've heard about how you defeated Sihon and Og. And uh, we know the Lord promised you this land. We know you're coming. And our hearts melted because of it, so spare my life and my family's life. And, um, and each of those kings, when they began to assemble themselves together and fight against the people, uh, they brought up those two kings. See, that's what happened on the other side of the river. Now they're in the promised land, and it's personal. These cities and, and uh, uh, these nations of people recognize that they're next. And this chapter, chapter 12, um, uh, lists for us in the last part of chapter 11, uh, 31 kings that were defeated on the west side of Jordan. 31. So they're just marching right along. You remember yesterday we talked about them going into each of these cities and they didn't leave anybody breathing. They hunted them down and, and uh, annihilated them. Why? Because that's what God told them to do. So up until this point, they've been extremely successful with the little bobble of Ai because of the personal sin of Achan that affected the uh, success of the Israelites uh, and the uh, deception of, of uh, Gibeon, the inhabitants of Gibeon who uh, pretended like they'd traveled a great distance. With those two little bobbles, uh, everything had gone quite smoothly. In both cases, what was not done? Consulting God. God wasn't consulted. Wasn't consulted before they went against the AI. He wasn't consulted when these folks came against him. They asked him questions, but they just accepted the answer on the surface. It seemed to be immediately after they made the, the lead with the Gibeonites that then they found out other information, which tells us why. The information was available. They just didn't ask for it. Uh, if they weren't sure, you suppose God would have given them some insight if they'd said, all right, what about this EP? Thank God we said, I'm not going to listen to you, Joshua. Don't ask such a question. No. He said, I'm going to be with you. I'm not going to leave you. So God hadn't gone anywhere. So Joshua could have called upon him, and he didn't. Because of that, well, that became uh, an obstacle for them. Uh, they're now, uh, what did they end up doing with the uh, Gibeonites? Made them uh, drawers of water and hewers of wood. All right. Kind of saved the conscience a little bit and said, okay, we've made a bad choice. But now we've got servants that can do some of our menial tasks. It'd be insulting to them to have to do those tasks and be helpful to us. And we'll let them do some of those things uh, uh, around the uh, sacred things. But then they had responsibility. God, God will be appeased. Big pardon? But then they had responsibility for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it. Next chapter. Now you're responsible for it. That's exactly right. And now they're here. And now they've got past behaviors. And they're going to be around you and your children. Will it have an effect? Yes. See, sometimes we appease ourselves by saying, you know, well, we got some benefit out of it. Got some, I know it wasn't a good choice, but you know, I've already made the choice now. So I've got to keep it. Uh, and because of that, uh, it's a real problem. They should have consulted God first. Now, the moral to the story is, before we make decisions in life, we don't consult God. Go to the book and say, what did he say? <laughs> uh, is that something I can do or not do? What would be the consequences of it? And, you know, we um, sometimes we use wisdom in every aspect, aspect of our lives with exception of spiritual decisions. That's right. So sometimes we make really good financial decisions. We make, you know, we, we, we prepare for you know, being shrewd and choosing our neighborhoods and, and schools for our children and all kinds of things. We do a really good job of it sometimes. And then when it comes to those things of eternal consequence, say, well, I'm not really sure what God said about it. 
But uh, I'm you know, a Christian, and, uh, and I hope I'm doing right. It's, it's more serious than that. The consequences of it are more serious than that. Um, even in our family functions, fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up and nurture and have the Lord. How do you do that? You don't consult the Lord. How do you do that? You know, sometimes it, just because of things our family flashed down. So that's where we ended up yesterday with that summary, and we emphasized that sometimes we sing a song, count your many blessings, name them one by one. You know, it'd be helpful to us when we conclude our day, kind of make a summary and say, uh, what all have we been blessed to do for and with the Lord today? And um, what a blessing that is. Isn't it a blessing? I can't think of anything else I'd rather do. There are a lot of things I like to do. And nothing wrong with doing most of the things that that I would like to do. Uh, Honest, uh, occupation, recreation. But my greatest joy comes from serving the Lord. Knowing that you not only um, are trying to do those things that please Him with your immediate behavior, but that you're sharing those principles with others so that uh, God's desire can be realized. What is God's ultimate desire? First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. For us to be saved. All right. He desired for all men to be saved. Here it is. We come to a knowledge. The son would have to consult God before we make decisions in life. And the ultimate decision and the spiritual decision we have to consult God. Um, the Hebrew letter began, and you're studying that in the morning, but the Hebrew letter began by saying, God who at sundry times and in divers matters spake in times past and fathered by the prophet. He had in these last days spoken to us by his son. That means we consult what the Lord would have us to do. And the Lord himself said in Luke chapter 6 and verse 46, And why do you call me Lord? Lord, and do not the things which I say. It's not like he expects us to say, what would the Lord have to do? It's not just a little bracelet you can wear and say, here's the abbreviation, what would Jesus do? You have to say, what did Jesus tell me to do? You know, he, when he was going to leave him, he told his apostles, I'm going away, and I'm going to send the comfort unto you, and he's going to remind you what I'm talking to you. And then he's going to teach you things you've not yet been able to bear. He guides you into all truth. And what is it that God wants us to come to the knowledge of? All truth. All truth. And according to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, we have been given all things that pertain unto life and godliness. But what if we don't consult? Well, we're going to find out when we get to the judges uh, what happens when you don't consult the Lord. We've had some... Uh, Glimpses of that already. So the land now will be divided for an inheritance to Israel. And um, that becomes uh, significant because uh, details of that division takes place in chapter 13 through chapter 22. Again, why would the Holy Spirit see fit to give you and I this minute uh, inch by inch uh, division of the land. So that the promise was fulfilled that he made to Levi. That's it. For us to understand that God fulfilled the promise. It wasn't a general, vague, well, maybe maybe that's what he meant. They're in the land, they're defeating their enemies, and now they take that property that once belonged to these people they just killed, and they divide it up among the tribes. And it tells us which tribe got what portion of the land? That'll become significant in all the other books of the Bible because we'll have reference made to these people and where they live. And when they were moved from that land, this property is taken away from them because they've become disobedient to God. So Joshua was uh, you know, probably around 100 years old now. Here's a man who's given all of his adult life in service to the Lord. Some of the things he experienced haven't been pleasant. Uh, he had to spend 40 years in the wilderness when he could have been in the promised land. But uh, he learned lessons by wandering in the wilderness. And the land which remained had to be uh, conquered. It's listed for us in chapter 13. Let's turn there now. 
and uh, begin our discussion of today's uh, uh, focus of the last part of the book of Joshua, the last half anyway. And Joshua was old and stricken in years, and we said he's probably about 100 years old. And the uh, Lord said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years, and there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. Nothing like being told you're old, is it? <coughs> Now, I'm at that age now, and I go to the doctor, that's the first thing he says, well, at your age, uh, what does that mean? You know, I'm going to the doctor for a particular reason. I know how old I am. <laughs> he doesn't have to tell me that, you know? Uh, but here's God saying, you're old and stricken in years. And here's an acknowledgement. Okay, Joshua, you know, we started out this quest together. I've given you charge, and, and I've uh, encouraged you, and I've strengthened you, but, you know, life has run its course. And preparation has to be made to what happens after you're no longer here. So you see the wisdom of God, and you see also uh, the confidence that God places in Joshua, even in his old age. And so this is the land yet remaining. All the borders of the Philistines and all the Gersherai, um, uh, when he begins to list what's left, why does God need to list that? Why well, was the Holy Spirit recorded to us that God telling Joshua what's remaining? Did Joshua know what's remaining? Well, he did. Um, why does God need to tell Joshua what's remaining? So that we can read it today. All right, so we can read it today. And for us to be conscious that God knows. If you ever start to do something uh, that you know the Lord would have you to do and you don't complete it, does it ever dawn on you that the Lord knows you didn't complete it? Have you ever made uh, commitments to the Lord? Say, Lord, if you spare my life, you know, I will give all my energy and all my effort in seeking your kingdom first. Ever done that? Ever had a loved one? You said, Lord, if their life is spared, here's how I'm going to treat them and this is what I'm going to do for them. Ever had any of those experiences and then maybe didn't follow through your life? You should. Does the Lord know whether it's completed or not? This is more specific because this is a conquest that the Lord has um, prophesied, uh, promised. And here's an expectation he has that this land is going to be conquered and these enemies are going to be driven out. But he also wants them to know, yes, you've been successful. And they just stopped and said, these are the two kings on the other side of the river that we have defeated on the east side. These are the 31 kings that have been defeated on the... Uh, on the west side, but there's still folks who have not been conquered. Now, did he say, I just want part of these people defeated? What did he say all the way back in the book of Exodus? Their iniquity is full, and I want them destroyed. I don't want you to make any leaks with them. I don't want you to uh, uh, spare their life. I don't want you to marry their daughters. No, I don't want you to give your daughters to them in marriage. I don't want them to be alive. So he's saying, there's still some of them alive. And uh, Joshua is experiencing life the way we experience life. You know, there's a fixed amount of time for us to be here. And um, he's about to run out of time here. And there's still work to be done. And um, land yet remains. And he mentions that land here. And uh, Sihor, which is before Egypt, even to the borders of Akron, um, uh, which is counted to the Canaanites. The five lords of the Philistines, I mentioned to you yesterday, you ought to know the five lords of the Philistines. Uh, they are acknowledged and they don't go away. They have to be driven out. They'll have to be destroyed. And you're going to see in this context they're not. Um, and he mentioned those five lords of the Philistines, uh, the Gazathites, which... Um, You'll learn a lot about the Ashdothites and the Ashkelonites and the Gittites and the Ekronites and also the Avites. And so uh, you look at those names, you think, here's the God of heaven missing specific folks who are still alive. It tells us a couple of things. That it is... When God mentioned them earlier in the book of Exodus and repeated that in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, he already knew they were there. He knew their, their iniquity was full. 
And he is not going to forget that they're still there. And uh, that that punishment needs to be carried out. And from the south, the land of the Canaanites. Um, and so he begins to break this down. And the Sidonians and the borders of the Amorites. And, and he's letting them know that he is fully aware of every square inch of this land he's there. And who did he promise to do? Abraham. He didn't say, you're going to have most of it, find you the best soil and, and the place you'd like to live, and I'll let you live there among the people. He said, it's going to all be yours and your descendants. And so God's letting him know that he's aware that there's still some of those folks who are still alive, and they've not been conquered yet. And uh, even the inhabitants of the hill country of Lebanon, um, they're still alive. All the Sidonians. Uh, them will I drive out from before the children of Israel, verse 6, and divide thou it by lot unto the Israelites for inheritance, as I have commanded thee. Now therefore divide this land for inheritance unto the nine tribes and the half tribe of Manasseh. Why just nine tribes? I thought there were twelve tribes. All right. On that eastern side of the Jordan, uh, Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh had asked permission while Moses was still alive back in, in the book of Numbers and uh, um, had asked permission to live in that land, to make that their home. Uh, that was agreed upon. But the requirement was what? That they couldn't fight with their brothers okay. until they were finished um, taking over the land. All right. Then they, they had to, the, home. the land could be there, but they'd have to cross over the Jordan with their brethren and help them conquer their land. And um, so those other tribes that didn't stay on the eastern side, uh, those uh, nine tribes and the half tribe, Manasseh, um, now will have this land divided to them. Uh, with whom the Reubenites and the Gadites have received their inheritance, which Moses gave them beyond Jordan, eastward, even as Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them. And that was mentioned back in, in chapter 12 also. And so it lists for us then that God also knows that what's already been done and how the land had already been divided. Uh, so these sections of land are still remaining. Uh, those uh, five Lord of Philistines, Agath and Ashdod and Ashkelon and Ekron and, and Geza, uh, uh, are important. And the Avites and uh, Sihar near Egypt, down in the southern part, um, Sidon, that Phoenician area, um, and uh, the area west of Galilee. And, up in Lebanon, and so uh, God's not liking with his geography, is he? <laughs> yes, sir. What's the best way to view the, the distinction between 11.23 and 13.1 where you have that God, that Joshua took the whole land, mm -hmm. and then 13 talks about so much more yet to be possessed. Right. He took it in the sense that they had crossed over uh, they're being successful in their conquest. There's not anybody that can stand against them. And so they, in, for all practical purposes, <coughs> control the land. They have not annihilated all the people. None of these other folks are going to come up against them. Um, and so they will, at this point, divide out the land that God intended for them then to finish driving the folks out. And they don't do that. And so... The, the difference is, the, the same as God said to them about Jericho, the city's already yours. And like he said to, to Ai, I've given it into your hand. In each of those other cities they conquered, he said, I've already given the inhabitants into your hand. So he's in essence saying, the land already belongs to you, because I said it did. And so you have it, but there's still work to be done. When he gave them Jericho, did they have to do anything? They did. When he gave them AI, did they have to do anything? They did. But when they did what he told them to do, it was already there. The same will be true now. What did he say back up in verse 6? He said, um, them will I drive out. Well, when he promised it to Abraham, um, back in Genesis chapter 22, it was as good as done. 
but there had to be some things happen, and, and uh, uh, God's time frame had to be met, and these people's iniquity had to be full, and so that's how I would view that uh, contrast of those verses. Uh, God pronounces theirs, but their part had not been done yet. They would not uh, killed the people. We'll see why in just a moment, and we'll kind of connect that to uh, some things that they um, they forgot about. This is an unfinished task, and uh, you know we can learn lessons from that. Uh, remember yesterday I said sometimes things happen and we pause and address those issues, and uh, we're expected to resume. And sometimes we never take it off the pause. <laughs> we just never. We talk about well, we used to be a really active congregation. We used to be a really loving congregation. We used to be a really excited congregation, but you know, so and so happened. You know, we just haven't been that way anymore. Uh, and so, here have been very successful folks. Here we had listed for us 33 kings that had fallen at their hand. But they're going to have a period of time when they say, you know, we used to be successful against these kings. But, uh, especially when we get to the book of Judges. That's a good question. Um, so, the uh, charge to divide the land in verse 6 and 7, um, and then from uh, chapter 8 and verse 14, we have uh, a specific breakdown of the land on the east side. And uh, it's already been divided, it's already inhabited. The Reuben, Gad, and half tribe Manasseh's wives and children are still over there now. These words are being spoken. So they already possess the land. Why would God need to pause and rehearse it at this time and say, uh, that's been given to them? Why insert that detail here? We've already had it. We've already witnessed it. Because now you're going to have a completion of God's promise, and that is for him to say, all the tribes of it will be represented. They'll all have land possession. And so we can go back and say, what do these tribes have? Now, to say they've already gotten theirs. Let's say what they have got. Let's geographically locate it, and let's tell its boundaries and borders, just like we're going to tell the boundaries and borders of all these other tribes. So people can't say, well, uh, I don't remember. And now we've got that document in hand where we have all of them Listed. So he goes back through that process again, and in describing those things that are given to uh, uh, Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, he mentions again Sihon and, and Og being defeated. And uh, uh, he also says that uh, uh, only unto the tribe of Levi he gave none inheritance. Verse 14, the sacrifices of the Lord God of Israel made by fire are their inheritance that he said unto them. What does that mean? According to what he promised back in the Law of Moses. That's right. Uh, when you go back to the Law of Moses and you look at uh, uh, Deuteronomy, or rather Numbers chapter 18 and, and verse 21 and following, and you go to Leviticus chapter 27, it specifically says God chose that tribe. And this is not a punishment. <laughs> you know, this is a selection of a tribe for a, an important task uh, for a work of the Lord. And they will, in essence, this tribe and their duties will be, in an Old Testament context, a representation of who we are as Christians. And in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, it describes us as a, um, a, a chosen people, a generation, a holy nation, uh, a royal priesthood. Christians are. We're selected to represent the Lord. And, and so they were the tribe, uh, given that they won't have a land possession, but guess what? Everybody who owns land, everybody who has uh, livestock, everybody who plants crops, are going to have to bring the first of those and give it to whom? Levites. Levites. They'll offer portions of that uh, in their sacrifices to God, but guess what? Even when the sacrifice itself is cooked, Guess who, who gets to eat from the sacrifice? Levi said, so you're taken care of. God is honoring them in that selection. And uh, 
So they're not going to be cumbered with land possession. And so they're going to be protected and watched after. And we'll have in these next few chapters, it articulated for us that they'll have cities. These Levites will. And their cities will be um, given to us. And we'll know who they are and, and uh, what the cities are. There are 48 of them that um, the Levites would receive. They had to live somewhere. And so they kind of space those out among the, the tribes. And they're able then to carry out the duties and represent all the tribes and uh, uh, bringing their sacrifices to the Lord. And all the tribes then contribute to the care of the Levites. And uh, that becomes important. So verse 15 through verse 33 um, kind of gives us detail of Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh on the east side of Jordan and the Levites receiving those uh, 48 cities. Those cities are are specified. And uh, uh, their cities will be just as important and uh, uh, just as valid as the borders of these tribes would be. It belonged to them. And um, they would possess it. And they would live there. They would be given suburbs uh, where they could uh, put these cattle and stuff that would be brought to them and that they'd be responsible for because they had to uh, provide for their daily needs in a, in a survival sense. And, um, you know, we, we would understand if you're going to uh, have uh, you know, milk for your children. You got to have the animals to get the milk from, and uh, so they had that. So they had the suburbs in order to provide for those immediate needs. But they didn't have the responsibility <coughs> of protecting and caring for um, an inheritance of land. We get to chapter uh, uh, 14. Uh, we have um, the inheritance of Caleb um, specifically being described. Uh, now, who is Caleb? <coughs> All right, he was that other, that other spy that um, brought back a faithful report and um, uh, would be described and will be described in this context in the same way Joshua was described as a man of great character. Um, and specifically here and in the first part of of the book of Judges, he'll be described as a man who wholly followed the Lord. And um, so when God makes promises, he doesn't forget them. He promised to care for these two men, and now we have that being specified. So uh, these nine tribes and this half tribe of Manasseh's inheritance is described in these next few uh, chapters. Uh, Israel inherited the land of Canaan which Eliezer the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of children of Israel distributed for inheritance. And so Eliezer represents the, um, the spiritual uh, leader of the religious side of things. And Joshua represented the civil side of things. He was the, the civil leader and the uh, deliverer and conqueror. And, um, and then obviously they had the heads of the, of the fathers of the tribes, and um, they'll be represented in those elders that outlived Joshua. And so they're involved here in dividing up this land and making sure everybody's represented and it's handled fairly. How do they divide the land up? By law. And, uh, um, and so, uh, as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses, for the nine tribes and for the half tribe. And Moses had given the inheritance of the two tribes and the half tribe on the other side of Jordan. But unto the Levites, he gave none inheritance among them. That's a, a repetition of what we've already learned. For the children of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. Uh, therefore, they gave no part of the Levites in the land, save cities to dwell in with their suburbs for their cattle and for their substance. The Lord commanded Moses, as the Lord commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did, and they divided the land. So now we have uh, Joshua being the leader, and Eliezer the priest, and these heads of the tribes uh, doing what Moses already commanded them to do. So they're not discarding now what has already been spoken to Moses, they're just carrying it out. 
And he told them, when you get into the land, here's what you're going to do. And so they're keeping that instruction, and they're dividing up the land. Just some incidental things. Um, when it mentions here the children of Joseph, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, uh, <coughs> and they gave no part to the Levites. So when you add up the 12 tribes, uh, if you counted Joseph and Levi, you'd have 12. Levi's taken out because they'll represent uh, God's cause and the sacrifices, so you have 11. Uh, Joseph himself uh, is not named as a tribe, but he's represented twice. He receives a double portion here of honor because of who he was and what his relationship to God was and, and because Jacob blessed him. Remember, before Jacob dies and he's feeble, Back in Genesis chapter 48, Joseph brings his two sons before him. Remember that little confusion? At least Joseph thought it was a confusion where his, uh, his blind father um, reaches forth his right hand and places on the youngest son. And Joseph tries to take the hand off and said, he's not my, uh, he's not my oldest son. And uh, he said, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, and they're both going to be blessed. And so here is a fulfillment of that blessing, that proclamation by Jacob. That Joseph is going to be represented twice with his sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Um, and so this is acknowledging that. God doesn't forget. And it uh, might seem like an incidental thing. Somebody just reading through it, you get here and say, how did that happen? It makes it interesting when you go back and say, this is how it happened. Um, God made sure it happened. And... Um, and the Lord commanded Moses to take care of this. And so the children of Israel were carrying out Moses' command. The children of Judah came unto Joshua and Gilgal and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, and said unto him, Thou knowest the things that are uh, the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee and Kadesh Barnea. Now, where is that? After that bleed moment uh, when the ten spies brought back the evil report and caused the whole nation of people's heart to faint. And Joshua and Caleb stood up and said, let's go up at once. Uh, God ended up you know, swallowing up part of that generation and defeating them when they tried to go up on their own and pronounced that they would wander in the wilderness 40 years, but he said, oh, by the way, all this generation is going to die while you're wandering around with exception of whom? Joshua and Caleb. And uh, Caleb here informs us that God said more than that. That God specifically pointed out that, that he would receive a blessing. And uh, Caleb hasn't forgotten and he doesn't assume that, that Joshua's forgotten and he doesn't assume God's forgotten. And he brings it up here. And notice that hasn't been the focus up till now. But you know, battles are being fought. Enemies are being defeated. We would assume all along, though he's not specifically mentioned, we would assume Caleb fighting alongside his brethren, wouldn't we? Joshua was. We would assume Caleb is. In fact, he's an old man now. He still wants to fight, doesn't he? He says, uh, he, he says he's still as strong as he was. He before. did. You know, it sound like, does it sound like your grandpa? It sound like mine. You know, it's like, hey, I can still take care of myself. And... Uh, when you have that confidence in God, you're not, you're not dependent on your own strength anyway. Has his God changed? No. And so when he said, look, let's go up and take these folks because they bred unto us, he still sees them as bread. He doesn't change his mind about these things. And so in this context, um, he said, 40 years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me and Kadesh Barnea. That's where the 12 spies were sent out. To a spy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in my heart. I know what I saw. And I know what God promised. And, and so he said, I brought that back. And uh, nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I truly follow the Lord, my God. Um, who is he speaking to? Who is Caleb speaking to? Joshua, you're two old comrades that go way back. And he's talking to him like uh, Joshua may not remember. 
And he's talking like maybe uh, uh, there's folks standing around that need to hear. Uh, you know, you ever go to your family reunions and and uh, the older people tell the same stories over and over and over. I mean, the same stories. Why do they do that? The only ones they remember. Well, why do they remember? Because <laughs> it has significance. Yeah. If you if you listen to them, they kind of capsulize life as they experience. It. It These are the important things. You know, a lot of things happen in life. This is the important things. I teach these books at the Memphis School of Preaching, and we were studying them just before the Thanksgiving and Christmas break. And uh, I challenge those students in that class, um, all 28 of them. I said, this time, and I asked them the same question. They're like, yeah. Your grandpa would tell the same story over and over. I've heard it a thousand times. I said, well, this time, this time, ask him to tell the story. And this time, listen to the same. Here he goes again. I've heard it. I'm going to go get me a plate of turkey and dressing. Sit down and listen to what he had to say. And you're probably going to think, ah. You see, one of these days, grandpa's going to be gone. And if you don't remember that story, you're going to lose a good portion of the history of your life and your family. And you're going to disconnect from that experience. And so, this time, listen. That's important in our physical families, but it's more important in our spiritual families. And so here's this old man, we would say, who has obviously uh, uh, got children, and uh, uh, probably grandchildren by now, and uh, he's not stammering and stuttering, is he? Uh, it's very clear. And it reminds us, it sounds like what we read in Numbers chapter 13 and 14, doesn't it? It said, Moses swear on that day, saying, Surely the land thereof, uh, whereon thy feet hath trod, shall be thine inheritance. Is that what God said? That's what God said. Um, and thy children forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord. What land had his feet trod? Canaan. Why had uh, why did the ten spies say we can't do it? Specifically, why did they say they couldn't do it? There are times. Now you listen to this old man and what he said. And now behold, the Lord hath kept me alive. And he said, These forty and five years, even since the Lord spake his word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am... This day, fourscore and five years old, I am yet as strong this day as I was the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. Now, therefore, listen carefully. Now, therefore, give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day, for thou heardest in that day how the Anakim were there. How did you hear it in that day? Oh, we can't do it. There are giants in the land. Now, of all the places, he said, give me that land. And that the cities were great and fenced. Oh, there were all cities there. If so be the Lord will be with me, then shall, uh, then I shall be able to drive out, as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb the son of Jephunneh, Hebron, for an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Canaanite, unto this day, because that whole, he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron before was Kirjath Arba, which Arba was a great man among the Anakim, and the land had rest from war. Now, Modern interpretation, we divide this land up, and we see that travel allotment. And uh, uh, you see Caleb specifically uh, asking for the land where the giants dwell. Modern day application, we'd say, uh, give me a retirement home in Florida. Uh, 
or a nice little mountain cabin so I can just, I serve my time, I pay my dues, uh, I don't want to face any more of that. That's the younger generation. Do it. You ever hear that kind of conversation? Maybe you ever think in those terms? Boy, I can't wait till I can just relax, you know? Coach, uh, I told you about the conversation I had with the, my uh, former co-worker at the post office, and he's asked me about, I knew I could be retired by now, and, and uh, he asked me about retirement in your church, he said. And I said, don't retire until we leave this life. He looked kind of perplexed, you know, like, well, bless your heart, you know, it's, Man, you're going to be at this forever. That must be miserable. Uh, but when you look at the context of, of Caleb, he didn't say, look, you know, we've worked quite hard to use uh, Joshua and uh, give me the, a place over there near the Mediterranean Sea so I can feel the ocean breeze and, and I don't want to be bothered by these, uh, these giants. He remembered why they didn't go in before. He remembered these were the obstacles. Now, you put it in our context and say, do you want your children and your grandchildren to have to face those giants and be discouraged by them? Or do you want them to see you face the giants and remove that obstacle from their life? That's what he wanted. He wanted to remove that obstacle. And of all the things he could have chosen, uh, he chose that. Um, he wanted that specific land. I think it's interesting that, that both of these men, Joshua and Caleb, um, are identified with their fathers, and it's always uh, an honor for uh, a, a, a father to have a, a child that behaves himself correctly. You know, the Apostle John said he had no greater joy than to hear that his children walked in truth. <laughs> and so, uh, Nun and Jephunneh must have been proud fathers to have two uh, boys like Joshua and Caleb who even in their old age were just as strong as ever their determination to be faithful to the Lord. And so that, that land is uh, uh, divided up and specifically request made by Caleb to uh, have a land that was an obstacle to his previous generation and uh, Praise is bestowed upon Caleb because of his faithfulness, just like faithfulness of Joshua. Uh, in this context, there will be no more general wars like we just uh, experienced, um, but uh, they've got some individual nations they've got to, to fight. Sometimes it would just be a certain number of tribes. Uh, then we fight them. Sometimes it's individual tribes that have to take on the enemy in their immediate context. And most of the time, it'd be multiple tribes uh, facing these obstacles. Um, when we get to uh, uh, chapter uh, 15, it continues the assignment to Judah and uh, the story of Ophniel uh, being uh, uh, stepping forward and, and fighting for his uh, people. And when you um, get to verse 13, in particular, it says, uh, chapter 15, And unto Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he gave a part among the children of Judah, according to the commandment of the Lord, to, uh, uh, to Joshua, even the city of Arba, the father of Anak, um, which city is Hebron. And Caleb drove thence the three sons of Anak, Who did we say Anak was? The giant. The giant. All right. Represented the giant people. And so the three sons, uh, uh, Ishay and Ahiman and uh, uh, Telmai, the children of Anak, and he went up thence against the inhabitants of Derby, and the name of Derby before was Turgis Sefer. And Caleb said, and this is kind of interesting here, verse 16, and Caleb said, he that smiteth Kyrgyz Sefer and taketh it, to him I will give 
Asa, my daughter, your wife. Is this a sign that he is getting people and can't do it himself? You think? He just got through saying, I'm as strong as I've ever been. Obviously, we would assume from time passes here, the land is divided, and now they have to face these obstacles. But is that an indication that uh, he can't do it himself? Or is there other reasons and wisdom we might see? Notice what he said. He's already driven out the sons of the giant. And um, now in their inhabitants, this land is divided. And Brother Brown asked a moment ago about, okay, he said, you know, the, 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 um, the enemies are still there. And he said, the land is yours. And it's now the enemies are still there. Um, but go ahead and divide up the land. Well, this is what he intended to happen. Once the land divided up, you drive out the enemies in your land. If you need help from your brethren, you can get help from your brethren. Uh, and so Caleb is about driving the enemies out of his inheritance. Uh, Joshua does the same thing. There will be some of the other tribes that don't do that. They don't drive out the inhabitants in their particular section of the country. But why would he say, okay, whoever takes Derby, Kurt just see her. They can have my daughter for a while. more comfort could a father have than to say, I know who my son is going to be. Somebody is not scared of giants. Somebody can go, and can go to war. Someone who will drive out the enemy. That's the kind of person I want to take care of my daughter. How are you going to find him? <laughs> you might give him a challenge and say, you take that city, you're the kind of man I want to marry my daughter. So you see, this man having great wisdom. Uh, sometimes we never... Go to that effort to work alongside someone and see how they uh, address things before we um, encourage our children to marry. Oh, you know, they make lots of money. But can they face the giants? What happens when they don't make a lot of money? What do they do then? How do they treat your son or your daughter then? You see, when the battles have to be fought and the enemies have to be faced, that's when you find out who a person is. You stand up before the preacher or before the judge and you make these vows to each other. And we talk about in sickness and in hell. For richer or for poorer. What do you mean that? I think we ought to have some way to measure whether that would really be true or not. How do we know? We ought to have lived long enough. We ought to experience enough things. We ought to face enough challenges to say, it's been proven they, they mean what they say. Uh, they can face such enemies. Uh, let me give you a little story that I think is a, you know, a modern day application of, of this kind of disposition in heart. Uh, when I first moved to Cordova, there were um, uh, a couple of couples one of, their, one of the spouses in each of the sets of couples but had some serious health problems. Dementia had set in. And one was a, uh, a man and his wife has, had lost her mind and uh, he cared for her just around the clock and uh, kept her there at home. And, and we'd go visit and you know she'd see things and say, get that cat off of that lawnmower. Well, there's not a lawnmower and there's not a cat. And uh, he goes and gets the cat off the lawnmower. You know, and acts like nothing's wrong. And the other couple, the uh, man has dementia and um, was a strong military guy, you know, and, and they were you know, high school sweet, sweethearts, and he went off to World War II, and they had this long, rich history. And But what happens when he's no longer that strong soldier? That husband is bringing home the paycheck. What happens when his mind doesn't function and his body has to be cared for? Toward the end of that experience, he had to be hospitalized. He had some kind of infection. And so I went to the hospital to visit the couple. And, and uh, uh, for a year, 
two years, maybe, we didn't know whether Jack knew us or not. And uh, the wife would roll him into the kitchen and um, pay the bills and fuss about utility bills and everything else like she'd always done. Just in case he knew, he was here. She wanted things to be normal. When he got that infection, a place in the hospital, uh, she'd go up you know, every day and eat him his meals and stay there and take care of him. And I was up one day and she was feeding him and he was drooling all over herself and, and she was cleaning him up. And, and the nurse came in and said, uh, uh, Miss Andrew, just go home and rest. We'll take care of him. She just kept feeding him and talking to me. And, uh, and she touched her on the shoulder and said, we get paid to take care of him. You just go home. Sister Hendrick paused and turned around and looked in that nurse's eyes and said, Young lady, I made a vow 55 years ago. I intend to keep it. He said, Yes, ma'am. And left the room. You see, we face giants like that every now and then, don't we? Easiest thing to be to say, Let somebody else face them. You know, too hard. Well, she stood there and said, For better or for worse, richer for poor, in sickness and in health. Did Caleb mean what he said in his commitment to the Lord? You give me this land, I'll drive the giants out. He said he drove them out. Those sons of Anak, he drove out. And now he wants to know that his daughter is married to someone who's not afraid of giants. And he said, I'll give him this city. It's part of my inheritance. I'll give him that city to take care of my daughter if he proves he can take care of her. And he does, doesn't he? And uh, this becomes significant in this context when we look at uh, Curtis Seifer being uh, also called Derby, um, being given the Othnil, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb. So here's his nephew. And uh, he took it, and uh, he gave him his daughter for life. And um, that's what he wanted to see. That's what he witnessed, and he kept his word and gave it dark. What a uh, comfort it must have been to say, you know, she's marrying a real man, <laughs> someone that will take care of her and protect her. And it came to pass that she came unto him, and she moved him uh, to ask of her father that he moved off now. You probably need to highlight off now because when we get to the book of Judges, he'll become significant. He'll be the first judge. Um, Identified in Israel. Um, so she moves up now to ask her father and uh, uh, for a favor. She wants a, a particular field. And you got to remember now they're dividing up the land. And so uh, water resources and those kind of things are significant. And, uh, and so verse 19 says, um, now ask of her father, give me a blessing, for thou hast given me the south land, and give me also springs of water. And he gave her upper springs and neither springs, so upper springs and lower springs. So in that particular location, geographical location, that became significant. Uh, this is inheritance of the tribe of the children of Judah, according to their families. And so when you go back and look at that, we have... Uh, uh, God being very detailed about the nations who had not been driven out yet. And he said, you go ahead and divide up the land, and um, then I'll help you uh, drive the, the, uh, the inhabitants out. And then we have some specific uh, application made to Caleb, and the promise God made him, and uh, how he went about seeing that his um, family is taken care of. In the spiritual context, Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, The thing that thou learned to me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, that shall be able to teach others also. How do you know men are faithful? You have to witness anything? How would Caleb know Othniel was faithful? How would he assume he'd be faithful to his daughter? Faithful to that challenge, that, that charge. You want the city? Uh, you want my daughter to go up and take the city? And did he go up and take the city? He did. He 
he faithfully carried out that responsibility. And so that's how we know we need to take that same kind of care in committing spiritual things to people. Uh, make sure we see how they perform and how they face spiritual giants. And, and then we can place in their hand uh, responsibility. And chapter uh, uh, 16, they give the assignment of the land to Ephraim. And again, we're reminded of those two sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. And uh, so in chapter 16, we have Ephraim. And in chapter 17, we have uh, Manasseh uh, uh, being articulated for us. Chapter 16 began by saying, And the lot of the children of Joseph fell from uh, Jordan by Jericho to the waters of Jericho on the east to the wilderness that goes goes up from Jericho uh, throughout Mount Bethel. So again, it gives us some geographical boundaries of the sons of Joseph, um, the borders of the inheritance specifically of Ephraim, are articulated beginning in verse 5. And um, and then when we get to chapter 10, again, this becomes significant. Look at what is said. When this land is divided, now the, the lots are, are drawn, and uh, that's how they know who gets what choice. Um, they uh, draw an allotment, and uh, you know, they've already assessed the land and what its value is, and, and uh, where all the hills are and the mountains and the streams and the forest and the desert. And so they know all those things. They divide it up according to Lot. And it says when uh, Ephraim has its land divided to it, um, uh, they drave out the Canaanites that dwelt in Gezer. From, uh, but the Canaanites dwelt among the Ephraimites under this day and served under tribute. What does that tell you? Here they had, obviously, the power to subdue these people. They drove them out of the land they wanted to live in. But what did they not do? That we learned when they went from city to city, and those 31 kings were defeated, what did they do in all those cities? Utterly destroyed them. They utterly destroyed them. There wasn't anybody left breathing. That's right. And now, they show the power over them. They defeat them. But they put them in servitude. Which takes us back to one of you, I think maybe Brother Brown's, uh, a moment ago mentioned when we were talking about the, uh, the men of... The men of Gibeon. Um, when they made that league with them, they put them in servitude, but now they're exposed to their lifestyle and their gods and, and their children. and They would have children intermarry and going to have the same thing happen when you start having these tribes not carry out their responsibility of of utterly destroying these folks. So they drive them them out, but they leave them in a uh, context of being in servitude. They pay tribute. They're allowed to to live and reconstitute. And then chapter 17 tells us that... um, a lot of Manasseh was drawn. And uh, uh, also as a lot of the tribe of Manasseh, for he was the firstborn, Joseph. Um, you go back to Genesis chapter 48, and again it rehearses for us that uh, he brought both of those sons, and Jacob blessed the younger uh, over the older. But he said both of them are going to be blessed, and both of them would prosper. And both of them would become tribes of renown in Israel. And folks will compare themselves to Ephraim and Manasseh. And so here you have their land a lot of being described, and uh, they divided it up. Verse 2 tells us kind of how they went about doing it by 
families for children. Um, and so this was pretty uh, significant. They went by tribes and then by families and then they divided up among the children. And um, God would even make for them requirements that they were to uh, set these boundaries and then they were not to remove those uh, ancient landmarks, places that would divide them uh, tribe by tribe. Uh, they were not to uh, not to move those things. They were to stay focused. Well, I don't hear him coming, but uh, it's been an hour and a half, and that's about as long as we can probably endure. If you want to take a break? Well, if that uh, if they stream our break, they'll just be part of a uh, classic spirit plan. They deserve one too. That's right. So what time is it? Yeah, let's take about five minutes and um, come back. We'll need to take off a little bit early. Is Jerry Wiggin in our class with Bill Stewart? I think it was a guy here. What about the scheme of redemption?